Hello and welcome to the Top of the Morning Show. I'm your host Jerry Gutka and we're here for a very special show today because usually I've interviewed any number of people on a whole lot of shows so far for Top of the Morning and for those of you that don't know they've always been non-scripted and I didn't know anything at all about the people we were about to talk to and I would just sit down and ask them questions of interest to to, to appease my own curiosity, so to speak. Today it's a little bit different because I know quite a bit about our guest. Our guest today is my mother, Catherine Getka. And we're here because she is going to be um, one of the unsung heroes down at the Women's Heritage Center. And we're taping it for that purpose as well as for the purpose of this show, Top of the Morning. We're going to be talking about Polish heritage because I am second generation Polish American. My mother was born here from parents of Polish immigrants who emigrated here to this country when my grandmother was 14 years old. And we're going to be talking about Polish heritage, we're going to be talking about my mother growing up in the Depression, and we're going to be right back after this break. <laughs> Tommy Thomas Trio from right here in Baltimore, Maryland. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Top of the Morning Show. I'm your host, Jerry Getka, with my very, very special guest, my mother, Catherine Getka. Say hello, Mom. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have Mom here today primarily because it's a special time for her as she's going to be inducted into the Women's Heritage Center. And we're just going to talk about what brought that about and why that's going to be happening. Bob, I know you're very proud of your Polish heritage. Um, why don't you tell us why and how that all started? Or, were you born in, in this country or were you born in Poland? No, I was born in this country, but my mother was born in Poland, and she was 14 when she came to America. And when I was born, she didn't know how to speak English yet, so it was all Polish at home. So I didn't learn how to speak English until I went to school. I knew a few words, but you know I couldn't speak it fluently. 
till I was seven years old. So that's why people think that I was born in Poland, because I was, you know, Polish until I was seven years old. And then I did learn English in school. And, and what school was that? A Holy Very Street. And it was all Polish in school. The neighborhood was all Polish. The school was Polish. The church. The stores. So we spoke Polish all the time. So I did learn a few words of English from the children outside when I played outside. And when I went to school, I knew a few words of English, but I had to learn how to speak it in school. Well, Mom, it sounds like your experience was not much different than the immigrant populations today when people come into this country and have to find their way and find a, a way to get involved with other people. Um, you had a lot of brothers and sisters. How many? It was six of us, three boys and three girls, and we were very poor. And it was uh, during, when I was about five, I think, it was during the Depression. So that was really hard. I remember we only had butter and bread to eat for our meals, three meals. And the other people had lard and bread. So we thought we were really rich, you know, because we had butter and bread. And the, the whole neighborhood, you know, was poor. Some of the babies died because they didn't have any milk. They couldn't afford to buy milk for their babies. But we had a bakery next door, and each one of us, whoever got, you know, old enough to work there, which was about eight years old, we went to work in a bakery next door, and they didn't pay you with money. They paid you with stale bread and buns. But we thought we were rich because we had that to eat, and that was, you know, really great. Well, Busha also had any number of jobs as well. What did Busha do? She worked in a cannery, and she had to go to work early in the morning. Oh, I didn't mention Busha is the Polish word for grandmother, so my grandmother, my mother's mother. Right, and she had to go to work early in the morning and came home late at night. And when she came home at night, she worked for a tailor shop, sewing pants. So my sister Ida, she was uh, five years older than me, so she was big enough to carry the pants to the tailor shop a couple blocks away. They were heavy because I helped her carry a couple of them. They were men's pants and they were winter pants. They were very heavy. And uh, we would carry the pants to the tailor shop and back to the house. And Busher would sew the uh, whatever she had to do on them. And then she would get paid maybe 50 cents. And she worked all day at the cannery and skinning tomatoes and packaging string beans in the cans, you know, all kinds of vegetables they had in a cannery. Well, that was part of your growing up as well. You used to go out to the field sometimes and, and Busha had you all picking vegetables and stuff? Well, when, in the summertime when the school was out, we would go out to the bean country and the children... <laughs> the bean would, country all the way up in Pennsylvania, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was in Bel Air. Pennsylvania, the hunger for Pennsylvania, which it, which isn't there anymore, but it was when we went bean picking, and the children would make enough to pay tuition for school. You know, when we we worked all summer, and I remember one summer, I, I was old enough to work in a cannery, and we had to make three buckets an hour, and everything over three buckets we would get a nickel. And I saw a ring in the shop, and it was $12. And I worked so hard all summer just to make, you know, the fourth, fifth bucket so I could make a nickel and, and, and you know, a couple nickels. And, and I did make the $12 through the whole summer. And today I still have that ring. I paid $12 for it, and I had it assessed one time, and it was over $1,000. So that was a good investment. That was my first business. Well, you, the things you're talking about doing sound like lots of hard work, but every time I've heard you tell stories about this, you always talk as if you were having fun when you were doing it. We did have fun. See, we were so tired after working all day, but then there were some boys that knew how to play the <laughs> guitar. You know, the farmer's uh, sons, they would come down at the corner store, and we would sit on the lawn 
and they would play you, the You were guitar. already a teenager by then, right? Yes. Okay. I was about 12. <laughs> and they would come and they would sing, they would play the guitars, and a couple of the older, you know, girls and boys, they would know how to dance and they would dance. So we did have some fun at night. We were never too tired to have fun. So, so, so even though you were poor, you, you didn't know it? Because we were happy. Okay. You know, we, we had a happy bite. We, we all got along together and and we worked and we were good, you know, people. Didn't get into trouble, except for one time. <laughs> <laughs> we, we weren't supposed to go f further away from the house that we did. And, and we, we were trying to do business, you know, we were big business. I, I must have been about eight years old then. And we went around to all the stores and we gathered all the cardboard boxes and newspapers and somebody had a little wagon. We put everything on the little wagon and we went down to the junkyard to sell it. And we got two cents for it. And it was about six of us, and, you know, some of the neighbor's children and all. And we didn't know how to uh, share the, the two cents. It, you know, between six of us. So we went to a candy store and we bought these little jelly hats. They were like 15 for a penny. So we got 30 of them. So each one of us got five of those jelly hats. They laced and, them. And you were the one that gave them out, right? You were the accountant to figure it all out? <laughs> no, the older one was. <laughs> I was the youngest one. And uh, those jelly beans, like something like jelly beans, and they lasted us for hours. You know, because we didn't chew them, we just let them melt slowly. Because <laughs> we very seldom got a candy or anything. And coming home, we were all sweated up, and it was a soda company going through the alley. We passed that soda company. I remember it was a Yuhu company. And this man was looking out the window, and he saw us, you know, working so hard and all sweated up, and he gave us a bottle of soda. So. He couldn't, you know, give us more than one bottle, <laughs> so everybody took a sip, and we were satisfied with just a little sip of soda, because we never knew what soda was like, and that was a treat, a real good treat. Well, we're going to let you take a little more time to think about that treat, and we're going to take a short break while I give you a glass of water so you can clear your throat, and we'll be right back. <laughs> to Catherine Gatka, my mother, I'm the host Jerry Gatka, and we're talking about her growing up and her Polish heritage for the most part to begin with. Mom, um, tell us a little bit more about growing up in a neighborhood. You talked about meeting these boys. Did you go to dances and things? We had a Polish home on Broadway, and when we were about 16, we were allowed to go to, to the dances in Polish home. But not alone, right? So every week they had uh, <laughs> a dance. Not alone. Was Mostly girls. It was during the war. All the boys were drafted, and wasn't very many boys going there. It was mostly all girls. So we learned how to dance Polish dances, and when the boys came back from the service, then you know we would dance. We knew how to dance by then. So, so they had Polish music. They had Polish music. You know, I think we've got a clip of a Polish band that we're going to put in right here, and watch this. You'll love it. We'll be right back after you watch mm -hmm. this clip. When they see the eyes of the I travel the highway on the sound. 
Mom, what did you think of that Polish music? Well, the the one Polish band that was playing there, he would always, the leader, he would always say to me, my my schoolmate, you were my, in my class. And I, I didn't remember him at being in my class until one time he had a break during intermission. And we sat down and we were talking, and then we, we named the, the nuns that were teaching us. And I said, now I know why I don't remember. You were a year behind me. I wasn't in your class. So he was a younger and man. He was uh. a year younger than me. <laughs> and, and he kept saying, you were in my classroom. And I had a good memory, so I knew he wasn't. And then we finally straightened it out. So, Well, well talking about these men in your life, um, tell us about how you met Dad, our father. Was that at one of these dances? No, I met him after Bush had made me quit my job and go to the bean country because I wasn't 18 yet. And when I came back from the bean country, I didn't have my old job, so I had to go to Bethlehem Steel. They were hiring. And he worked at Bethlehem Steel. So when I worked there, I, I saw him and he kept, he was coming down the aisle and I had just lost one of my friends. He was in the army, he was 19, and as soon as he went overseas, he was killed. And your father looked just like him. And I thought I was looking at a ghost. <laughs> he was like his twin brother. So, so that's where I met him and work. But I didn't talk to him for about a year, because <laughs> he had another girlfriend at the time. And when he broke up with the girl, then I started talking to him, and we started going out. And and that's how I met him. So you went to and some of these worked. dances? No, we, we had a... Did a, Dad dance? I don't know if I ever saw Dad dance. He was a good know. dancer. He went every weekend. They had a, a, a place on Boston Street. I can't remember the name of it, but it was a nightclub. Everybody used to go to that nightclub. And he went there every weekend. So that, then when we started going out, I started going there to dance with them. And, uh, well, Mom, you and Dad went together for a little while, and then finally you fell in love and got married, had a family, mm -hmm. and you went back to the old neighborhood, right? Right. W um, when you finally, you bought a house, right? How did you manage to do that? You were the accountant, and you were the one good with all the money. You, 
at least from the stories you've told me, mm -hmm. you said that you used to take care of all the money. I did. <laughs> Your father spoke money like it was <laughs> water out of the spigot. Okay. But you were the saver. You, I was a miser. You bought a house and you, you had to fix it up, right? It was a rat trap. <laughs> and we did fix it up. And he was a handyman, so he did most of the work himself. Which and was I, typical in those days. And I did a lot of work. I, I could paper hang and paint. And I could lay tile on the floor. I could do the walls, the conga wall. They used to call it conga wall. And now it's paneling. <laughs> so I did all that. I figured everybody else could do it. They weren't born doing it, so I can learn. I learned how to do all of that. Now what I remember yeah. most about growing up is the house where we lived on, on near, near Pratt and Ann Pratt Street. Pratt Street. Mm -hmm. And it was a three-story house. Yes. And we always had people living with us. And that's, we had to have them living with us because we didn't have any money to buy the house with. So he's, he had an old car and we needed $200. The house was $3,500. And he sold the car, we bought the house, and it was three apartments. So we had uh, Ann Irene on the third floor, it was family, and Chuchiati on the second floor, and we had the first yeah. floor. Chachi is the Polish word for aunt, so it was right. our Aunt Ida, so, your sister. So we had the first floor, which was convenient because they they only had uh, one child on our third floor, and Aunt Ida didn't have any children, and, and I had three children, so first floor was better for me to have. And the rent paid for the house. So he, after he sold the car, he had to take the street car to work for a while. And then he bought another old car and he knew how to fix cars. So he fixed it and then he had another, you know, car to go to work with. So that's how we bought the house. Yeah, I remember and Dad always had a car when we were young. We took a loan out for 15 years and I paid it off in six and a half years. So I always paid a double payment so that I could save the interest. And it was always family living with us because I remember Aunt and Irene moved out and then Aunt Betty moved in. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Aunt and Ida moved out and, and who moved in? Nobody, the Nobody because moved in. we moved. Okay. Uncle Walter had the confectionery store and he died. In the same neighborhood just down the street. Two doors away. Right. It was only one house in between us. So when Uncle Walter died, I bought the store. And I didn't need any money then, because the stu the house didn't have any mortgage on it, so that was a down payment for the store. Use the collateral. For and it was the, the assets you need assets, so that that bought the store, and the store was already go a going business, and from day one I made enough money to pay for the mortgage on the store. Now what, so, it was mainly because of, of Uncle Walter dying that you took over the store? Well, I was thinking of uh, getting a divorce from your father. We weren't getting along too well. And I was thinking ahead and I thought, if I buy the store, I can stay home with the children, three children, you know. And I could stay home and I didn't have to go to work and leave the children home save me a babysitter, you know, fee. I didn't have to pay for a babysitter. And I could run the store and keep the children right there with me. So here it is, the late 1950s. You're a single mother with three children to raise. And you ended up in a business. And I, I thought I would only stay there about five years and then I could, you know, get another job because you were 12 and Bernadette was 10, Linda was seven. So then I could go, you know, you were all in school, and I thought, five years I can go out and get another job. But the store was doing so well that I stayed there for 35 years. We've talked about any number of things growing up during the Depression, um, finally getting you through your teen years and getting married and having three children as a single mother and a business person. Um, tell us a little bit more about your business and, and, and how you got into that. Well, the way I got into it is because cause it was a, a building we could live in. Yeah, we lived over top of the candy store. And I didn't have to go out to work. I could stay home and have the children with me. 
and I planned it, and we did get along. You know, we didn't get along too well, but we got along enough that I could take and, and plan ahead. So I took all his money, all, he, <laughs> gave, he gave me his paycheck every week, and I saved it up for a whole year. And when I saved up enough for your education and their education, then I let him keep his money because I didn't want to have any hard feelings. And I said, if I keep it all his money... Well, well, that must have worked because, as we'll find out in a little bit, you remarried Dad 40 years later after the divorce. 35 years 35. later. I was close. Mm -hmm. I was close. So, but I want to talk a little bit more about growing up in the store and, and, and how you became a businesswoman as such. You, you didn't have the training for that. You only went to seventh grade. Yes, but I did have experience because while Walter was in the hospital, I took care of the business, and Bushuck didn't know too much about it, and my sisters didn't have much time. So they helped out a little bit, but I think I did most of it. I did all the ordering, I did the, the I did everything in the store. Well, you knew everything because you had us working in the store at times. How much trouble was that for you? <laughs> it wasn't too much trouble because you were a good kid, <laughs> and you listened, and you helped out. So like and your generation. When, when I went in to cook, you, then you, you watched the store. Yes, I remember that. And then but, I, but you started working when you were seven or eight years old. I worked in a bakery. Right. But you were, you were nice to us because you didn't make me go to work till I was 12. Right. <laughs> and uh, I think she, Bernadette was about 14. Yeah, she, she, got, she got to take a break until she yeah. was 14 years old before she exited. I don't know if that's true or not. But but okay. And, and we worked in the store. And you helped out, and then you helped out around the house. You did what you could, and then... I remember then doing painting. Bush, I remember that. Yeah. And a couple of years later, Busha came back to live with us, and then she did, you know, a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. So she helped out. And it was easier when she came back. So we grew yeah. up mm -hmm. as, as living over top of the candy store. And for the most part, right. you talk about growing up poor. I don't really remember us as being poor. I mean, we didn't necessarily have a whole lot, but we always had what we needed. You had candy and ice cream <laughs> and chips. What more could you want? That's right. What more could a kid want? You, you, right. But I never felt like we were poor as such. But it, again, it was in the neighborhood um, mm -hmm. down in, in what's now called Upper Fells Point because we were at the corner of Pratt and Ann Street, our little candy store. And I never felt deprived as a child. And I don't think you did either, even though you grew up during the Depression. I think Bush took care of that, and you took care of us. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we were young. We didn't know what, what it was to have a lot. That's true. What you don't have, you don't miss. That's true. That's very right. true. All right. Okay. So we grew up. You sent me away to school. I eventually went to private school, went to college, and graduated. And Sis went away to um, a, a private did. school as well to become a nun. Right. She was going to be a nun. <laughs> and you stayed in the store for how many years? 35 years. 35 years. What yes. finally got you out of the store? Well, the And guy, out of the neighborhood, for that matter. A guy come in one day, and he tried to rob me, came in with a gun, and I started to give him the money, but I thought, it'll take me a year to make up that money. So I didn't give it to him, but I always told everybody that I had a rifle in the other room. And if they ever try to get me, I'm going to get them first and their brains are going to be all over the store. But when he came, finally came in and, and I thought of it, I thought, I can't stand the sight of blood. So I couldn't do anything, you know, that drastic. So I walked into the other room and made him think that I had a rifle. And I heard the gun click, but I had a statue of St. Teresa on a shelf. And I looked at St. Teresa. And I heard something, but I didn't know what. I was afraid to turn around. And when I went in the other room, I picked up the phone real fast and called the police. And Brian, my grandson, was in the other room. And I said, don't go in the doorway. And he said, why? No, he went in the doorway and said, why, right? He said, why? And I said, go away. I said, and he said, why? Nobody's here. I was afraid to look myself because that gun really scared me. And uh, I had to call the police three times before they would come. 
and the guy did run out when I looked at that statue of St. Teresa. That's, that's when I heard the noise, and he ran out of the store. Instead of him scaring me, I scared him. <laughs> and then Bernadette already bought the store from me and the building, and she, she was sleeping because she had night work. And she came downstairs and she said, what's all the noise about? And then she found out that, you know, I was, after 35 years, and it was I was close to getting, you know, killed. He could have shot me. And it was right after that, that and I call my, my sister Bernadette Sis, that mm -hmm. Sis made you close the store, right, finally? She didn't make me. She just took the key and closed it. It was her store. <laughs> <laughs> she paid for it already, but she never did open it. So that was the end of the story, but... It was the end of the story, be, but it was the end of the story. It, before I closed the story, I knew who the guy was because he had a bandana on his face, but I saw his clothes, and I think I knew him. So every morning I walked past his house, and he had a big dog, and I'm so scared of dogs, but the dog didn't scare me at all. I walked past his house and gave him the most the worst hook you could give anybody. Within a week, he moved away. So he didn't get me. I got him. Well, I'm but glad that all worked out. And, yeah. and, and it wasn't a worse story to tell, and that you're still here to tell a story. Now, Ma, we're talking about you were owned a small business, a confectionery store, and you finally had to close it after 35 years. Now, I can remember growing up with Linda and Sis, and you working all the time. In the beginning, you were working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Now, all of a sudden, 14. 14 hours a day. That's right, because you did prepare before and after and got things ready and cleaned up. Now, all of a sudden, 35 years later, you're closing the store. What did you do with all that time you had left over now? Well, after I closed the store, then uh, I joined the uh, Sodalities in church. I joined St. Hedwig's. We worked at the dances, the dinners, in the kitchen, cooking food, and then the next day serving it to all the people that came in. And then they had some dances. I joined the uh, Third Order of St. Francis, and we had meetings once a month. So now all of a sudden you had time for all these things at church. Right. Okay. And then I joined St. Anne's group, which was the, the one that was the most work because I became the uh, financial secretary and it was a lot of books to take care of and that took up a lot of my time. Then I had a few days left so I worked, went to work in a rectory and I worked uh, a few hours in the rectory three days a week. So you found a way to fill up all your time? I did. <laughs> <laughs> well you, you were married, yes. she, she was away. Linda was married. And, and Linda was married, so I did have a little bit of time. And then Busha uh, came back, you know, Busha was living with us. And That's she, right, you took care of Busha for a long time. She, she wanted, well, she wanted to go to Poland, and she didn't want to go by herself. So she said, if I had somebody to go, I would go back to Poland to visit my family. I forget she about all your trips to Poland. How many yeah, times did you go? Just twice. And, and then she wanted to go again. And I, I said, well, I, I have time. I got, it's a cheap trip. <laughs> it was three weeks and everything was included. The airfare, the hotels, the meals, $595 for three weeks. So I said, I can afford that. So I went to Poland. And this was back Russia. in, that was the 70s, right? 71. Right. And then I went for that three, three week trip to Poland and I was scared of, of getting on a plane, but they had a little prayer card, and the priest was in charge of the trip. And he said, if you're afraid to go on the plane, then just leave your, put yourself in the hands of God and leave it up to destiny. I said, okay, who else could I leave it up to? You know, more than God, he'll take care of me. So I wasn't afraid to and go And in the plane, that. you're closer to him, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't have far to go to heaven if anything happened. So I went on the trip, and it, it was so good. I met all my cousins and my aunt and my uncle, and it was such a good trip that I went back. Every two years, I went back to Europe. You, you said you went twice to Poland. You meant you, meant you went twice with Busha. 
No, how, many, how many times have you I been all together? I went once with Bush. Uh, but how many times have you been all together? And I went once with uh, Bernadette in 1993. You've only been twice all together? I thought you went more than that. To Poland. Oh, that's I, right. I went to Rome and uh, Germany and Italy and there 13 different countries. I made eight trips to Europe. Not bad so, for, for a kid growing up in a depression. Right. And each trip was, you know, real cheap because it was a big group. I always went with a group and you get group rates. So the second trip was $720. And, and then the last trip was $2,300. That's how much the rates go up every few years. So it was eight trips to Europe. All right, so you spent your time going back to the church and joining all the groups and traveling quite right. a bit. You went to Poland and mm -hmm. other places in Europe. And then you came back and you went to dinner with Sis and you met somebody. Went to dinner with Sis? You went to dinner with Sis. And this scraggly old oh, oh, gray-haired yes. man oh, yes. with a beard came up and kissed sis. <laughs> he, he tried to kiss her. This we, stranger, we, you thought? Yeah. He, he came to the table and he said, do you have a kiss for your father? But he said, father, so low we couldn't hear him. Now, this is a story in and itself. she turned around. Okay, before you get into that, this is a story in itself. We just finished talking about Poland and all your trips there. Now we've got a short clip, we're going to show that, and then we're going to come back and tell the story of how you got back together with Dad. Let's take that break right now. We'll be right back. to our guest, Catherine Getka, my mother. And my, what I want to talk about now is how you got back together with Dad after 35 years of divorce. Well, as I was saying, we were, we're sitting in this restaurant, Linda and Bernadette and I, and this man comes over. Now, you used to tell this story saying this dirty old man came over. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he, he sat next to Bernadette and he said, can I have a kiss? Do you have a kiss and a hug for your father? But we didn't hear the father part. And I didn't see him and they didn't see him for about 23 years. 
and he his hair got gray. He had black curly hair, and now he had gray hair. He grew a beard, and we didn't, you know, recognize him. So she turned around and she said, "I don't kiss any dirty old men." <laughs> and he looked so hurt, and he went back to his table. And then she said, "Did you know him?" And Linda and I said, "I think that was your father." <laughs> and she said, "Was it?" And she went to his table and. And she asked his brothers, he was with his brothers, she said, is that my father? And then his brother said yes. And then she apologized and now, she Sis started was, to talk. Sis was only about eight years old when he left, right? Yeah, and then she was like maybe 26 when, when he came around. And so... I don't, I don't understand that, but this, this is 35 years later, so okay, go ahead. Well, she might have been 30 then. Anyway, uh, she went to his table and apologized and she started talking to him and then she started going out with him and then she took me up his house after about a year she took me up his house and she said he cleaned up the house just so you could come in and and look at it and all and I and I wouldn't go in and Linda wouldn't go in because Linda was mad at him about something and she didn't forgive him yet so after about five minutes we decided to go in for a couple minutes so i said i'm only going in for a couple minutes and then we're coming out so bernadette goes in and we go in and if we walk in the door right, so so this couple minute visit turned into you remarrying dad after 35 years <laughs> right <laughs> and that took about two years later. <laughs> it took me about a year to start talking to him. So you remarried him. Dad and you went back out to live with him, back out in Essex. Right. You still had the store downtown, but Sis owned that. And the store wasn't open, it was closed. And you lived with Dad for a number of years and then finally... Twelve years. Okay. And then I got a heart attack and I had a triple bypass. And Bernadette, she took me home and <clears throat> she took care of me. And then he was supposed to move out with us. Right. But he had 5,000 pigeons, so he was pretty busy. And he was starting to sell all his pigeons. Dad was a pigeon man. And there were many articles in some of the Essex papers about Dad and raising his pigeons. And in the books, in the pigeon books. Right. And then he, he got down to 2,000 pigeons. And it was almost time for him to come up and live with us. And then he got and sick. Then, and then Dad passed away. And he passed away. So he didn't come up. But that had a good life. Us. Died he, two weeks he before his, his 90th pigeons, birthday. Right. We've talked about a person who is a, is a first generation Polish American, grew up during the Depression in a very poor neighborhood, very poor household, who never knew she was poor, just as we never knew we were poor growing up. And you made a life for yourself in lots of different ways. <laughs> we're up to the point now where you wrote a book. And you wrote a book about everything we've talked about, about your story, mm -hmm. Mom's story. And Mom, all I can ask is now you've had a very full life, you've done lots of different things, you've met lots of very interesting people. What are you going to do next, Mom? What's next for you over the next 20 years? Whatever comes up, it's all in God's plan. If he has something planned for me and I can do it, I'll do it. Okay. I, I'm not going to plan anything myself. Because when you plan something, something always comes up and your plans are changed and, and you can't do what you wanted to do. I don't think we can top that. So I think we're going to say goodbye at this point in time and say thank you for coming and talking to everybody and telling us your story, Mom. And we're going to say goodbye to the top of the morning show. Wave goodbye. There we go.